Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that there of course there is into it this is the acquia podcast and i'm speaking with peter hallett and laura lafave two lovely people that i met a few weeks ago at dribble camp bristol which was um on an amazingly sunny warm couple of days <laughs> in the southwest of england and we met on the business uh business day of the camp you came up to me after I gave my presentation at the event and told me, and, and we ended up having an amazing conversation and I'm trying to <laughs> bring it all back in my mind just so that we can, can capture some of this. Um, and your company, which is called, I'm guessing, Encore. Encore? <laughs> ah, okay. Um, uses Drupal in a couple of really, really interesting ways and also is succeeding at a couple of business challenges that um, not everyone manages to succeed at. And, I, and I'd like to try and uh, sort of recreate uh, large swathes of our conversation again today. Sure. Um, why don't we start by you introducing yourselves, um, perhaps each individually, and then uh, a little bit about Encore. Okay, um, I'll introduce myself first and you okay. can do the Encore bit. Uh, my name's Peter Hallett. I'm the uh, head of product engineering for Encore and one of the co-founders with uh, Laura and Bob Sun. Okay. And I'm Laura Lefebvre. I'm also one of the co-founders, as Pete mentioned, uh, but I'm currently a CTO of Encore. Um, Encore uh, helps build nudging apps, uh, nudge apps as we call them. So our platform basically combines the latest in behavioral science, uh, analytics, and collaboration to help our clients quickly build custom apps to help nudge their teams to boost performance. Um, you know, today we, we're working with a lot of clients who uh, were helping to take their diagnostics online. So they have an existing diagnostic that helps their potentially their clients, or internally, identify opportunities for improvement. Uh, but by translating this into a nudge app, we get all the benefits of a diagnostic, which is good in itself, you know, to uh, quickly identify you know, what, what could be improved. Um, and then we can take it to the next level, which is nudging an individual, and therefore a team benefits from that, uh, to actually take advantage of that opportunity and improve. And, uh, and see that performance improve, improvement. If I understand correctly, this is taking so-called big data and analyzing it and then turning it into real results and benefits for uh, your client organizations. Is that right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, in a lot of cases, well, we can use some existing data, um, but... Often, one of our principles has been, well, let's just ask the experts because you know, everybody's trying to get these insights from big data, but actually it's in the people's minds. So let's provide an interface using you know, Drupal, basically, uh, that gives people the most efficient way of getting that expertise out of their heads. You know? yeah. So rather than us analyzing, you know, rows and rows of data to try and get this insight. Let's just ask them. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the sort of the big data, you know, distilled um, is an important component of the overall picture because we're really trying to bring, when, when you're sort of nudging somebody, you've, you've got to bring all of the relevant information together in one, at one point. And so big data has its, has, its, has its sort of role there. But also, um, you know, like as Laura said, like the small data, just asking the right person at the right time is also really important too. Okay, so please give us an example, a concrete example of, of um, a, a nudge application in action. Do you want to talk about, give an example of like the sales app? Yeah, sure. Okay, well, one of the uh, 
apps that we've been working on is helping people to understand um, when they're setting up their sales target for the year, um, what makes a good sales target. And, you know, so is setting a sales target, uh, you know, to be a little bit high, a good thing, and so that it's achievable? Or should you be setting a home run sales target so that you're really, you know, uh, out of your comfort zone? Uh, do those tend to be more achievable than, you know, uh, you know, a slight improvement? Uh, so capturing from uh, a group of people, um, you know, how they go through that sales target uh, setting process and then tracking throughout the year how they're doing in terms of meeting their sales target. And then analyzing and sharing that information in real time with the with the whole team, in terms of okay, people who uh, set their t sales target this way, uh, maybe you know, and how they go about that process with their manager or by themselves, um, and how they track their sales target achievement throughout the year. Um, just providing a platform and an app to share that information constantly throughout yeah. the year and gain insights so that everybody can start to improve I think and th see the best practices. Yeah, there. the other dimension of that, that that sort of feeds into the nudge part is kind of as you maybe make different sales, not all sales are the same. So um, what are the characteristics of the ones that you've been successful doing versus the ones that you've failed doing. So it's really important not to track just the ones you win, but also the ones you fail and be able to distinguish the cast characteristics of those so that then when people are going through new sales processes, the system can kind of go, hang on, this kind of looks like the ones that you've kind of not been so successful at. You might want to change target. Or one of the other things that we do with, and it bring back the kind of the big data thing is that we'll take the sales data from a company and we'll make our data scientists will make odds tables so that we can see for a company, for instance, um, you know what, if you let um, a sales cycle go longer than six months, your odds of winning that plummet. So once you start to get into that routine, that, that regime or, or, or sales that start to look like that, it'll nudge you to say, Hey, you might want to wrap that up or focus on something else. So it's that kind of feedback mechanism as you go through it. Oh, wow. Okay. So now I, I really see the nudging part and that's fascinating. This feels very similar to, in, in, uh, at least on one side of it, it feels very similar to agile uh, sprint methodology and um, at the same time learning what succeeds so that you can double down on success. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Yeah. Very exciting. So since Encore is not a household brand, mm -hmm. um, can you just give us an idea of the uh, scale of your business um, in terms that you're comfortable talking about in public? Sure. Uh, today we're working with uh, global companies um, and you know, so large enterprises uh, who, like I say, you know, may have a diagnostic or just really want to create a nudge app from scratch, uh, see an opportunity within their team in areas we walk, work across all sorts of areas, but you know, um, largely in sales, uh, financial services, and uh, you know, also helping consulting firms. Mm. Some of the large consulting companies are are um, really seeing the value in what we're trying to do. My, I want to pin you down just the tiniest bit more, <laughs> but only um, because. Uh, I'm I'm completely fascinated by what you do and how you do it, and uh, I, I just want to give an idea that that Drupal, in the end, is is this engine that is driving a, a huge amount of, of of business that is, in your case, not, you know, a bunch of websites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right. large, large, very large companies and very huge, big contracts and making millions of pounds of dollars of difference to those organizations is, is fair enough to say, right? Well, we are a startup and we're, we're getting there. Our, our growth is like year on year is, is triple digit. So, you know, we're, we're getting really good traction in terms of the rate of growth. Oh, you um, did tell me you're hiring. Yes. <laughs> we're definitely hiring. Yeah. Sure. Um, and um, I would say our, you know, if you look at the, the, you know, cause essentially what we've built is a, um, a, a, a platform as a service, right? That we that we sell to these companies, and I would say our our average cost of sale is 
very is competitive, if not better than your average PaaS platform. So we've also, I think, we've got good good business model there in terms of what we're selling. Terrific. Well, that's also great to hear. So I want to know a tiny bit about your backgrounds. Uh, in what did you study? What's your work experience? And I come from a, an academic background. I actually studied maths and physics, and then I did an MSc and a PhD in physics um, back in the nineties. Um, did a little bit of time in academia. Didn't didn't did one postdoc and then left for industry. Um, went to work for start, tech startup companies in, in the late 90s. So I've worked for a number of startup companies um, coming up through, um, you know, a number of database technologies, um, a lot of Microsoft background and also a lot of open source background through that. Um, in, the, in the middle of the, the 2000s, I actually changed gear and went to work for Accenture, so a big consulting company. So a real, a real step change. But a fantastic experience. It gave me a huge amount of business experience. I went to work for across a lot of different industries, um, a lot of you know, um, with with a lot of very large, very reputable companies, and I got my fingers into their you know their innards in terms of changing how they did, did business. So, um, seven years of that came out the other end, and um, you know, the, the, the mashup of that business experience and that early technical startup experience, I felt really prepared to take on a challenge like Encore. I, they, uh, I was just thinking back when Acquia was about 50 people and I'd say 35 or 40 were technical at that point. Um, among my colleagues were two PhDs in astrophysics, <laughs> one nuclear physics PhD, one molecular biochemistry uh, PhD who had come straight out of biotech startups to work for Acquia. So, so this, um, oh, and my good friend, Eric Evrard from the one agency uh, used to work at CERN before he did uh, Drupal. So, so yeah. <laughs> you're in very good company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. About businesses. yeah I, you know, you know, back when I was doing it, you couldn't, there wasn't, the kind of wealth of open source. If you wanted to do an, an, an analytics, and I did as part of my PhD, you better go write your own tool. You know, one of the chapters of my PhD is basically a software piece. Mm. You know, that's how it was back then. <laughs> <laughs> back in the, in the olden days. Right, Laura. Yeah, um, I also came out of an academic background. Uh, I did a PhD in computer science uh, at the University of Bristol. Um, and then uh, I did also move into industry. I've worked mainly in the areas of uh, safety critical systems. Um, so across the board, um, rail, air, um, and process control. And then also, uh, so I also had some time in Accenture where I worked as an enterprise architect. And um, then uh, prior to Encore, my most recent role was actually being uh, responsible for the delivery of all the batch um, uh, data from uh, one of the largest or one of the three um, consumer credit uh, agencies in the U.S. So um, that was a really interesting experience and it gave me a lot of um, direct experience with uh, big data. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The size of the database for the uh, U.S. consumer mm. credit information, uh, you know, yeah. it doesn't get much bigger. So, um, yeah, and uh, we were, we were uh, you know, working with that every day uh, to deliver to, you know, all of the uh, financial institutions there. So, yeah, uh, so, and then um, basically decided to do something very different and join Encore. So, giving a little piece of the game away, you are not really using Drupal as a fantastic kit for building websites. Um, in fact, I think Peter's almost exact words to me were that um, Encore chose Drupal for its, rad up, uh, for its ability to do rad rapid product development and deployment. I'm curious, with your massively technical uh, backgrounds and business experience, one or both of you, please tell me your first Drupal memory, how you discovered Drupal and, and how you ended up choosing Drupal to be the backbone of your technology stack. Well, I don't know about my first Drupal memory. It's sort of, uh, 
that's going to be a, that could be a tricky one. It's uh, a lot's happened in the last three years. <laughs> and it's, and it's been a it's been a steep steep kind of uh, learning curve. But I, I can certainly talk about why we chose Drupal. If you want to just cut to the chase, yes, please. Um, uh, you know, from my background, you can see it's like I've used a lot of different technologies across a lot of th- a lot of different you know um, parts of building applications and different architectures, and um, I don't do like fashion code it's like i just see like a toolbox with tools inside of it right so it's like what's the right tool for the job that i want to i'm I'm trying to achieve right now so i look i looked at it from from that perspective or well we looked at it from that perspective um drupal as you mentioned gave us you know flexibility it gave us speed as a startup company we started with an idea um, what we're doing right now has a kernel in that idea, but it's not the same thing. You know, everyone's heard, heard of pivots. As we've come, come along the last two, three years, we've pivoted a few times. We wouldn't have been able to make those turns as quickly if we had gone for a more bespoke, like lower layer to the architecture. Drupal allowed us to be flexible um, at, a, at, a, in, in, at a pace which allowed us to make those turns and land where we are with, a, with, with what we feel is a really good business offering and a good technology. So that's, that's, that's part of it. Secondly is um, we knew that when we settled then, and we're not changing quite so rapidly, that what we had done to that date wasn't going to um, you know, have to be replaced. That we what we built would then scale because you know you can make Drupal scale. So you've got this initial pace. As long as you've got some good architectural principles in place, you can then really build on top of that once you kind of lock it in. And we went then in two directions. If I can sort of veer into sort of you know the kind of a little bit more of the detail of our architecture, we've got the classic use maybe of Drupal as kind of with, with some marketing content. But for us, that's a very small part just to kind of advertise our business really and let people know what we do. Um, the actual deliverables that our customers end up with are HTML5 applications. So our platform as a service built on Drupal basically spits out apps that we configure very quickly. A bit of development, quite a lot of configuration. We've built probably like 40 or 50 of these so far we can do them quite quickly so there's a whole part of group management for each of the enterprises there's a whole piece of there's a lot of configuration data but that isn't accessed um, frequently it's a small number of users but need, need a lot of administration that's a perfect place for Drupal to sit we can use all of the built-in Drupal stuff, all of the, the content types we can configure those up lots of admin screens rich interface easily adjustable uh, as we grow and add to it, and that's great. And then where we need our high-performance data analytics, we use Drupal in a headless way. Um, the HTML5 applications are built on an Angular JS framework on the client side, tons of Ajax, Drupal at the back end, feeding, feeding data to those coming from you know, uh, either uh, external data sources or, or our internal data analytics. So it's like this three-headed beast, but Drupal's kind of at the heart of it, and... Uh, it plays very nicely at the heart of it, and we're very happy with it so far. Fantastic. You preempted a, a lot of my architecture questions um, right out of the gate, too. <laughs> if you had to uh, tell me, uh, well, what would be your favorite Drupal module or your favorite bit of Drupal functionality? I think the bit that's helped us the most has actually been OG, the, the, oh, org- yeah, yeah. the organic yeah. groups module. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's um, you know a lot of those a lot of that administration back end is logically separated into but essentially a group hierarchy. I think we've built a lot of stuff on top of OG, and we've kind of going through a second cut of our architecture using it as OG's gone to version two. Um, that would cause us a little bit of pain, and we had to kind of rethink how we're using it so that when they go to 2.5 or 3 or whatever it is, it's not so painful next time. Um, but but at the heart of it, it's very solid. It plugs into Drupal very well, it, you know, um, from a permissions perspective and a lot of those things that you want to be, you know, you don't – we have to get those things right for our customers. It's, it's vital. We do a lot of QA around it. We're very thoughtful about how we do that stuff, um, and it's a solid component that helps us enormously. Okay, so shout out – Big thank you to Amitai Borstein, the maintainer <laughs> of OG, who happens to be a friend of mine. 
Oh, huh? fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> on, on that theme, talk about running your startup in an open source context. I think open source really works well for a large variety of business critical uh, scenarios. Yeah. Um, yeah, and especially Drupal. Drupal is such a professional platform, um, and you do have a lot of confidence when you're using Drupal that you have a community of people that are just, you know, really switched on to making sure that this is a uh, secure and, you know, really an enterprise-ready platform um, to use. Um, and then, you know, having the support of Acquia as well. We're hosted on Acquia. Uh, very happy with that. So, you know, it, it really, there's been... Uh, a lot of reasons from that context that specifically we're happy with uh, being on the Drupal platform. But, you know, in general, I've, I've always been a fan of open, open source uh, for, uh, for enterprise you know, and the benefits that you naturally get from that. Yeah, and I, th I think as we've built things out, um, you know, coming back to the kind of the rapid prototyping part of things, the ability to, you know, when you're, when you're sort of, you know, you have a choice when you're building. You can either, there's a lot of contract modules. You can piece them together and kind of create the functionality and see if that's what you want and, and kind of use it. That might even then be performant enough, or at least you've built it and know that you want it so that if you need to bespoke, you know what you're actually building after having built a prototype. So I think that richness out there, because, you know, con contract mod modules come in a, a lot of different flavors and maturity. And even though you might have something that does what you want, you have to, you know, you have to evaluate each one, but the fact that they exist and you don't have to write from them from scratch is fantastic. It's a great starting point, at least. I would really like to be able to convince a lot more startups to look at Drupal at least at a minimum as a technology for getting a minimum viable product out the door. And I have seen in a few cases, it's a real enabler for someone with a startup idea to... Um, put together a Drupal application that proves the concept and works for some value of works. Now, maybe that particular architecture, as you mentioned, uh, itself won't scale, or maybe things need refactoring, or maybe Drupal is not the ideal final technology. But um, it empowers less technical users to such a degree that I really, really think that more people with startup ideas could turn to Drupal first to, to get the ball rolling. So I, I'm glad you said that. Totally yeah, agree. I think and, that's reasonable. Yeah, we're a great example of that. Actually, you know, I was, well, I, I was responsible and involved in that decision early on to, you know, uh, create Encore on Drupal. And, uh, you know, like you say, it just allowed us to, to get our product, you know, you know, realized to a prototype level very quickly and then from there we evolved it and we could grow mm -hmm. and it is actually scalable and performant in your case you're doing just fine with it in in real uh yeah yeah i mean so far i mean you know there are, you know i'm head of product engineering i'm i'm always going to have things i want to improve but um i don't see you know when i look at the size of our business and the size of where our business will be what i look for are do I have sufficient number of levers that I already know about that I can I can pull or dials I can turn that will keep cranking that up? And at the moment on our architecture, I don't see an end in sight where we would not be able to continue to scale to meet demand. So, you know, that's good. Because, you know, you want to be able to look ahead and go, well, if we get we get busy, busy you know, busier than we are at the moment, um, we need to be able to do that, and we can. Fantastic. Yeah. I know you've been following the Drupal 8 release cycle. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling about that? What are you most excited about? And how do you think it's going to benefit your business? Well, clearly, um, with use of Drupal 7 in kind of like more of a, a headless mode, that's, um, I don't think it was designed originally with that as much in mind. You know, I think maybe there was a, maybe a nod to it, but I'm not sure how well they did. <laughs> I think 8 has got much better thinking in that space and i'm very excited about how it's really the thinking you know i was listening to Dries a couple of years ago talking about drupal 8 in one of the drupal cons and you know this note this this, this notion of it being a, a, a you know a, a jigsaw piece in the 
in the jigsaw of an enterprise landscape, not this thing that kind of sits to one side that maybe has a couple of the plugins or adapters to other systems, but it's like this meshed in engine in the middle that's like a content platform. And so we're, we're, we're platform as a service. So clearly that is well aligned for us. So, you know, and again, you know, I think when we chose Drupal 7, 8 was very just a glimmer that there wasn't a lot of thinking of, you know, that we could even really, you know, we didn't choose it because of what eight was going to be, but okay. certainly when we were a year and 18 months in and we could have pivoted off of Drupal and we were reevaluating because we're always reevaluating our technology stack, eight and the thinking behind eight was one of the things that helped keep us on Drupal actually, because we was, could see where it was going and what it was going to try and achieve. I mean, if we, if we, if we cast our minds back to when Drupal seven was architected and that is between, you know, depending on, how you want to look at it, it's at least eight years ago. Mm -hmm. maybe 10. Um, mobile was nowhere, right. nowhere in sight, much less a multi-device reality, much less Internet of Things. And Drupal 7, though you can run it in, in well, let's call it headless Drupal 7, for lack of a better term, um, you can do it that way. It does make very, very strong assumptions that it is outputting HTML, that mm -hmm. it is running a website. So it, it takes a lot of work. And... Drupal 8 is architecturally, so, and when we started the 8 cycle, the thought was, well, mobile first, and we've, we've even moved beyond mobile first now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Drupal 8 is, is loosely coupled, and it's designed so that uh, systems that you're simply not going to need in your application don't have to be bootstrapped each time. You can turn off whatever you want. Dependency injection lets you sub things in and out. It's great, so you can really, really make it incredibly streamlined, use exactly what you want to, um, even if you disagree with some of the choices there, you're free to, to really make it your own. And that's, that's incredibly, it's an incredibly uh, visionary set of decisions, considering that a lot of them were taken five years ago. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. No, I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's shaking up nice. I mean, you know, I'd like to have had it last year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great that it's coming out so fast um uh, the other thing for me is just as kind of a you know just a kind of more from a computer science perspective the move to fully object-oriented architecture is also really important um it's uh you know for us when we're when we're building stuff it's kind of a it's a little bit painful to still have to write you know kind of more functional code uh for where, where drupal kind of demands it and it'd be nice to not have to have those anymore another part of your story that fascinated me when we met in person in Bristol was that you're a U.S. startup mm -hmm. with um, a technical office in Bristol in the U.K., which is sort of crystallizing as the third technical hub in uh, the country, I believe. And you succeed at working very, very well with a team of Indian developers. So you have a sort of tr triple distribution thing going on can you uh tell me how that came about and how you make it all work yeah laura why don't you give yeah. me the origin and i'll talk about the details <laughs> the day-to-day the -day details yeah we were very fortunate uh, early on um you know again we wanted to scale quickly and so uh we actually ended up talking to the team at Aquia and uh asked you know um if we could uh talk to some of the uh partners that you have and um we were introduced to a team called Srija, um, and they have been absolutely fantastic to work with. Uh, you know, part of the thing about, you know, technology and where it is today is this, you know, the ability for us to be, you know, distributed physically and really still work very effectively. So, you know, we're on Hangouts most of the day. We're very lucky here in Bristol that, you know, uh, we have uh, fiber to the door for everybody. You know, so our network is fantastic here mm -hmm. in the city, and I think it's one of the reasons why you know uh, we're becoming one of the um, tech hubs in the UK. Uh, and we also have a fantastic uh, uh, quality of skills here in Bristol. So you know, it was a no-brainer in terms of uh, you know establishing a a tech center here, uh, which really effectively allowed us to work uh, with India and with the US across the day. So, and we also get the benefits of follow the sun, um, you know, for a startup, you know, that kind of stuff really uh, helps us uh, in terms of our ability to quickly deliver for our clients. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a business model and a decision that you have to be comfortable making. I mean, 
we've both spent a number of years in consulting companies um, working with you know project pyramids that always involve some sort of offshore component I've got I had 10 years of using offshore teams prior to Encore I knew exactly what I was going to get how how it should be how that capability should be used and um, and also just the the maturity of of, of the offshore teams and their ability to, to work across time zones and with different cultures has just got better. You know, we, we happen to use a, an Indian team, which I'm, I'm most familiar with. Um, and we have a, a great relationship. Um, and you know, we, we get a lot of benefit from it. So it's, it's a real delight. I like, I really like, I really like this model. Um, shout out to Rahul and, and say hi to him for me, please. Yeah. Next sure. time yeah. you're on the call, which is probably in <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yeah, and and so the US component is is it that you have a lot of customers there? Yeah. So all you know at the moment, all of our business is in North America. Our sales function is is there. The um, our data scientists are are there um, in the Boston area um, from you know the you know Harvard and the local you know universities there. So. Um, we get a great pedigree of people coming out of there that, that, that sort of feed into the sort of data science part of what we do. Um, and so then, you know, we've got our, our you know, tech leadership is in, in Bristol and a, and a small development team here. And then, a, a, you know, a larger scale development team in, in India. Give us your shameless plug for Encore. I think as we talked about today, you know, uh, Encore is a great example of how you could use Drupal uh, to very quickly ramp up your startup, you know, so that you can explore and uh, create a product that uh, that feels in you know a niche, um, you know, nudging apps uh, and having decision analytics support uh, for all the decisions that we make in a day. You know, we're truly excited about being in this space and being uh, you know one of the uh, you know, front runners in terms of this technology, and this was all really enabled by Drupal. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'd say to like the developers out there that you know, if you want to, if you're familiar with Drupal or you want to get into Drupal, and you're kind of like you know, you're, you want to do full stack development, you want to get into cool technologies like Angular, you want to push the boundaries of what Drupal does, you know, not just the, your average marketing site. Then um, you know, give us a call. There's a good shameless plug. Laura was kind enough to plug Drupal, which is fine. You know, <laughs> you can edit out my plug. <laughs> uh, no, nah, it was nice. It was nice. Oh, hey, so thank you so, so, so much for taking the time to get uh, back online and, and recreating a lot of our conversation from. Mm -hmm. that, um, was actually a, that was actually a lot of fun. It was, uh, yeah, it's my first, first podcast. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> oh, great. Hey, so